Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaskar. In this course, Positive Psychology, the first class is on Introduction to Psychology and Historical Background of Positive Psychology. In this class, I will cover Introduction to Psychology, its branches, perspectives of psychology and then humanistic perspective in detail as historical background of positive psychology. Psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mind or sometime we call cognitive processes. Psychology is the scientific study of human thoughts, feelings and behavior and in this field we study how people act, how people think and how people feel. So broadly psychology deal with human behavior, internal as well as external behavior. So if we say internal behavior then mind and cognitive processes and if we say overt behavior then the observable behavior of an individual. Different psychologists have addressed this behavior and cognitive processes differently. There are various schools in psychology in which they had unique style to address behavior and cognitive processes. Let us take some examples. For example, first perspective in psychology is structuralism. Important contributors of this school are Tichner, William Wundt and their associates. It aims to identify the basic elements or structures of psychological experiences. Another school, functionalism, they focus more on functions of mind. William James is an important contributor as well as he had various associates who are, uh, explored functionalism with him. It attempts to understand why animals and humans have developed the particular psychological aspects that they currently possess. So broadly, function of conscious experiences are being studied under uh, this uh, perspective. Another perspective is psychoanalysis or psychodynamic. It focuses on the role of our unconscious thoughts, feelings and memories and our early childhood experiences in determining behavior. There are various important contributors in this field like Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, Adler, Eric Erikson and their associates. Another perspective is cognitive which focuses more on thinking process. Main focus is on the study of mental processes including perception, thinking, memory and judgment. And uh, Herman Ebbinghaus and Piaget have been main contributors of this field. Behaviorism another perspective which focused more on overt behavior rather on cognitive processes. Watson Skinner are important contributors along with the, their associates and this approach is only concerned with observable stimulus response behaviors and it states all behaviors are learnt through interaction with the environment. Another perspective is trait perspective and trait theorists are primarily interested in the measurement of traits which can be defined as habitual pattern of behavior, thoughts and emotions and Alport, Cattell, Ising and various other scholars have worked under this perspective. So if we just revisit all these perspectives, these perspectives are saying that our behavior is determined by certain factors like psychodynamic or psychoanalysis perspective says that our behavior is mainly determined by our childhood experiences. A cognitive psychologist said our behavior is mainly contributed by our thinking process and behavior is saying that it is the learnt behavior in terms of stimulus response and they have given importance to the environmental factors. On the other hand, trait psychology is saying that it is the our personality is composition of certain traits and these traits are habitual patterns of behavior, thoughts and emotions. So to some extent we can consider our behavior is determined by certain factors which are described differently by different perspectives. Contrary to all previous 
perspectives. Humanistic perspectives focus on the free will. Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow have been main contributors of this school uh, along with some other associates. They believe that you are essentially good and that you are motivated to realize your full potential. So, humanistic perspective as I mentioned earlier also, it is actually focus on free will and uh, they are saying that we are programmed to grow. So, let us know a little bit more about these perspectives, so that in next classes whenever I give reference one could easily understand what does it mean. So, if we just talk about basic unit, basic unit as per these perspectives are behaviorism, learnt behavior and we study stimulus response connections, cognitive processes, thinking processes and our more focus is on in SOR series on O, O means organismic processes or cognitive processes. Psychoanalysis, psychodynamics, they focus mainly on unconscious mind which is contributed by our childhood experiences and type and trait psychologist basic unit for studying human behavior is traits. And uh, as I mentioned humanistic perspective saying that, that we are free, we have free will and we are programmed to grow. If we just count some other factors along with the, these basic units, I think we can understand a little bit more uh, these perspectives. If we just count how did they define normal behavior, how did they define abnormal behavior, what was their methodological processes and which the psychotherapies they have proposed to study human behavior. In next slide, I will discuss these perspectives in terms of how did they define normal behavior, abnormal behavior, their research methodology as well as psychotherapies which were proposed by these uh, different schools. However, Indian perspective is also important, but it will be discussed later in detail. So, when we say uh, as per this perspective, what is normal behavior, what is abnormal behavior and what are the therapies proposed by these schools as well as their research methods. So, let us take one by one for understanding a little bit more uh, this perspective. Cognitive perspective as I mentioned earlier also, they mainly focus on thinking process. So, as per this perspective, what is our normal behavior? If we have adaptive thinking processes, then we have normal behavior. Then what, what is abnormal behavior as per this school? As per this school, abnormal behavior is maladaptive thinking processes and they have proposed cognitive therapy also. Counselors design the therapy to correct maladaptive thinking process. They have used various methods to collect data to uh, define human behavior like interview, psychological testing, case st studies, etc. Let us take another perspective, you will find totally different style to define human behavior in terms of normal as well as abnormal and their therapies are quite unique as compared to previous perspective. Psychoanalysis and psychodynamics, they have focused on unconscious mind and they are saying that causes of normal and abnormal behavior are mainly in our childhood experiences. Childhood experiences, if we had normal, then we have normal lifestyle. However, in some cases, we may have traumatic childhood experiences. Suppose, in some situations, childhood was full with anxiety, conflicts, unfulfilled desires, traumas, etc., which is reflecting in our unconscious mind. That is cause of abnormal behavior as per this school. For therapies, they mainly focused on hypnotism and dream analysis. In methods, they had hypnotism, dream analysis, projective techniques and case studies, etc. They counted that dream analysis as royal road of unconscious mind. Another perspective to define human behavior, it is behavioral perspective and they have mainly focused on learnt behavior. So, what are normal behavior as per this perspective, what, what are abnormal behaviors and way of uh, uh, treating abnormal behavior that is again a unique style. For example, for normal behavior, they said conditioning resultant reward and punishment and SR connections. So, if we have normal SR connections or we have adaptive conditioning. So, in that case actually we have normal behavior, but in some setting some wrong things are reinforced 
and that is why we have faulty conditioning style. So, that is why we have faulty learned behavior that is cause of abnormal behavior. Deconditioning of faulty conditioning style and establish adaptive conditioning style by using reinforcement is uh, subject matter in their therapies. So, in their therapies, first of all, they identify faulty conditioning style, then they decondition this style, and then they establish adaptive conditioning style by using some reinforcement strategies. They used experimental method and verbal reports. They uh, outrightly rejected subjective views of collecting data or subjective way of uh, getting data to define human behavior. They outrightly focused on experimental method. I think it is most scientific research method in psychology and that is why we are able to say psychology is a science. You know, experimental method is very important to have reliable, valid, universal studies and very, very objective results we get through experimental method. Another perspective is type and trait psychologist perspective and they have mainly focus on traits and traits define our personality. Then as per this perspective, what is normal and abnormal behavior? Normal personality traits as per this perspective are uh, causes of normal behavior and these traits are actually result of heredity and environment and their interaction. So, then what are the causes of abnormal behavior? As per this school, we may have abnormal behavioral traits and there are individual differences. They also focused on physiological reactions. For example, strong versus weak sympathetic nervous system. Some of us have very strong sympathetic nervous system, that is why emotionally stable patterns we have. On the other hand, some of us have weak sympathetic nervous system and due to this weak sympathetic nervous system, we have higher uh, emotional reactions. However, they have considered that the uh, triggers of abnormal behavior are in the environment and with we have some environmental situations which are triggering our emotional reactions and some of us are more emotionally instable. That is why more reactions we have towards uh, depression, anxiety, stress, etc. Then what are the ways of treating abnormal behavior? Because they rely more on heredity, that is why they said uh, least chance of changing someone's behavior. However, they observed that if there are some environmental causes of abnormal behavior and uh, accordingly we can borrow certain therapies from different perspectives. For example, they said for treating faulty conditioning style, conditioning strategies can be used. If we observed learned behavior is the cause of abnormal behavior, then behavioral therapies can be borrowed from behavioral psychologist. On the other hand, if we find causes of abnormal behavior are in uh, childhood experiences, then psychoanalytic therapies can be borrowed. Cattell also proposed psychotherapy by structured learning theory. However, one cannot understand this therapy without knowing his theory in detail. He said, adding or dropping some new patterns in our behavior, it is just like throwing pebble in the pond and uh, uh, we can easily uh, get change in a whole personality rather just adding or dropping a particular behavioral patterns. For example, when we start to do yoga or meditation, this yoga or meditation is not only one aspect in our personality which is added here, rather it has reflection in our all aspects of personality. It is just like throwing pebble in the pond. On the other hand, if someone starts to take medicines or some, uh, someone starts to take drugs, in this case, it is taking drugs is not only one aspect getting added in his personality, but it will reflect in all other aspects of his behavior. Another, I think, very, very significant contribution of type and traits scholars is psychological testing. Maximum work has been done by this school to uh, establish psychological testing in psychology. You know, regress statistical techniques we use to develop psychological test. 
and uh, we have item analysis, we do factor analysis, we calculate reliability, validity and norms etc. to establish psychometric properties of a scale. Another perspective is humanistic perspective. This perspective is very important for us because it is historical background of positive psychology. Here we just know what it means when we say normal behavior, what are the causes of abnormal behavior and how, what is their therapy to treat abnormal behavior and their uh, technique and in details it will be discussed later. So, normal behavior as per this school is we are programmed to grow and we are growing, but sometime we have incongruence between real and ideal self that is cause of abnormal behavior. Roser has proposed Roserian therapy to treat abnormal behavior and their technique is q sort technique which will be discussed later in detail. American Psychological Association has identified 54 divisions in psychology. I think you should know how many fields in psychology we could have. So, you could study 54 courses in psychology and broadly these schools have different uh, reasons to have different branches. So, these reasons may be first reason basic psychology versus applied psychology. In some branches of psychology, we focus more on theoretical aspects and our interest is to understand human behavior. On the other hand, in other branches, we focus more on applications. For example, positive psychology in which we are trying to understand concepts, how do we assess these concepts and theoretical interpretation of positive behavior. On the other hand, in applied positive psychology, our focus would be more on applications. So, we may have various divisions in psychology uh, in which we on the basis of this basic versus applied aspects, we may have different branches like positive psychology versus applied positive psychology, social psychology versus applied social psychology etcetera. Some psychologies are based on context and can say contextual psychology. We study behavior and cognitive processes in particular context like behavior and uh, cognitive processes and in environmental setting. So, environmental psychology, in social setting, social psychology, in cultural setting, culture psychology, in community setting, community psychology, in organizational setting, organizational psychology. So, like that there are various branches in which we study in particular context and this context is one branch of psychology. Another criteria could be stages, age wise we have different branches in psychology like child psychology, adolescent psychology, adult psychology and in developmental psychology we address human behavior as per different stages. Some branches are based on behavioral variation like abnormal psychology, positive psychology, clinical psychology, counseling psychology etcetera. In 21st uh, century, uh, there are some branches which are highlighted more compared to others like cognitive neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, cultural psychology and positive psychology is also highlighted in 21st century psychology. Our next topic is humanistic perspective and positive psychology. In this area, we would like to know what are the historical background of positive psychology. Before knowing positive psychology, I think we should know how this field has been very important and even before its independent initiation. Independent initiation of positive psychology, we had some scholars who worked on positive aspects of human personality. So, uh, then I think it will be easy to identify how some of these constructs are already revealed by psychologists before uh, starting positive psychology as an independent discipline. So, self-efficacy, uh, you know self-efficacy means the mode I can do. So, Albert Bandura did wonderful work in this area. There were various prevention programs which were already established 
by Albi and Cohen and they did a research on normal individuals to improve their well-being and well documented prevention programs are there. There are various researchers who worked on happiness, on resilience, on optimism and other cognitive and emotional processes which are highlighted now in positive psychology. If we just talk about different perspectives, I think humanistic psychology or Abraham Maslow's and Carl Rogers work is a significant contribution to positive psychology. The term positive psychology was first used in 1954 by Abraham Maslow in his uh, motivation and personality book, who complained that psychology as then practiced said little about man's potentialities, his virtues, his achievable aspirations or his full psychological heights. So, he himself realized that we are focusing more on negative aspects of and somehow we are skipping to study potentialities of an individual, his virtues, his achievable aspirations or his full psychological heights where we should focus more. So, even before Seligman which will be discussed in the next class, uh, scholars realize that we are comparatively focusing less on positive aspects of human behavior. Abraham Maslow was highly influenced by William James. William James became increasingly interested in how to awake human potential. He was convinced that we use only a tiny fraction of our full range of emotional and cognitive capabilities in daily life. In James most influential book, the variety of religious experiences, he stated spiritual and mystical experiences as providing important clues to the height of human personality. The viewpoint influenced Abraham Maslow and the founding of humanistic psychology. Even today, humanistic psychologists focus more on positive aspects of human behavior and they study what, what is healthy, adaptive, creative and addresses the full range of human potential. Positive psychology shares ideas with humanistic psychology. Positive instinct to fulfill human potential, I think is common in positive psychology and humanistic psychology. Strong motivation force to do good, be the best that they could be, self-actualization, client-centered therapy. So, work which is done under humanistic psychology is still relevant in positive psychology. Let us know a little bit more about humanistic theories because that is historical background and uh, highly connected with positive psychology studies. If we consider humanistic theories in reference to other theories, then it is counted as third force. First force is counted psychodynamic theory and second force counted behavioral theories. On the other hand, this is third one that is called humanistic theory. As I discussed earlier also, they observed that humanistic theories or humanistic perspective, they observed that human dignity is missing in previous approaches. When we are saying our behavior is determined by childhood experiences, our behavior is determined by childhood experiences. Our behavior is determined by environmental factors. Our behavior is determined by heredity and environmental factors. Our behavior is determined by childhood experiences. So, in all these cases, we are saying that our behavior is determined by certain factors and we can't do anything. So, if we go with this approach, somewhere human dignity is missing in these perspectives and that is why just opposite to all previous perspectives which are saying that our behavior is determined by different factors. So, this perspective saying that it is not so and we are responsible for our action. Responding to the situation is our own choice. So, how do we respond to the given situation? That is our own choice, rather it is determined behavior by certain factors. They emphasized on individuality and personal expression. Uh, they said we have our personal responsibility and as per personal responsibility, we select behavior. We have choices for behavior. And uh, sometime actually uh, that is cause of abnormal behavior in some situations, we may have a conditional environment 
and that is cause of abnormal behavior also. Uh, sometime from social cultural pressures, our situation is you have to and that is cause of abnormal behavior. So, they said we should have not have to and not conditional environment. So, then we have our own choices and we are active shaper of our life. Their main motto was the here and now, do not focus on the past, do not focus on the future, be in present. This is uh, you know in next classes I will discuss its mindfulness exercises and we have personal growth, we are programmed to grow. Let us know a little bit more Carl Rogers self theory and it is very important to understand why do we have normal and abnormal behavior. He has used various terms. So, first of all I think we should know all these terms to understand his theory. First term here is the phenomenology of the individual. It means structures of conscious as experienced from the first person point of view or we can say that is our subjective world. How do we think within ourselves or in our mind? How do we feel in our mind? That is our phenomenological word. He also talked about actualizing tendency and organismic valuing processes. He said, uh, however, we have certain needs and want to fulfill those needs, but for those needs actually we have certain values and that is called actualizing tendency or organismic valuing process. So, it means when we are hungry, we need food, but this, uh, this is not just any food, but food that tastes, that values good. So, we have values for certain things and for fulfilling our needs, we take into account those values, the, those tastes which are really important for us. He also discussed about another term that is called conditions of worth and he said uh, conditions of worth is very important for having positive regard as well as positive self regard. Let us know what does it mean. As we grow up our parents, teachers, peers and the media and others only give us what we need when show we are worthy rather than just because we need it. It means we do not get the things whichever we want to get, but we have to show worthiness for those things and we deserve to have those things. For example, we get a drink when we finish our class, we get something sweet when we finish our vegetables. It means everywhere we have conditions, first you do this, then only you can do next activity. Most importantly, we get love and affection if and only if we behave in a particular conditional manners. So, it means certain ideal behaviors are expected and if we do those experiences or those uh, behaviors, we show those behaviors, then only we are able to get this conditions of worth. And if it is so, then conditional positive regard we will be getting. So, if we are doing as per these conditions of worth, then we will be getting positive regard. So, if we do conditions of worth, then only conditional positive regard we will be getting. So, getting positive regard on on condition it is and Rogers calls conditional positive regard. Conditional positive self regard is connected with conditional positive regard. If we have conditional positive regard, then only we would be having conditional positive self regard. Over time this conditioning leads us to have conditional positive self regard as well. And as per the uh, result of these two conditional positive regard and conditioning positive self regard, we have positive regard as well as positive self regard. Positive regard like love, affection, attention, nurturance and so on we get from others when we fulfill conditions of worth. So, here it is conditional. If we will fulfill these conditions of worth, then only we would be getting love, affection, attention, nurturance, etc. in terms of positive regard. If we have positive regard, then this is connected with positive self regard. Then we would be having self esteem, self worth, a positive self image, etc. So, it means good little boy or girl, ideal self 
means or from societal masses may not be a healthy or happy boy or girl that is real self. So, broadly we can say there are two selves one is from our personal side that is called real self and another one is from societal side or societal masses can be an ideal self. Let us know this theory in terms of a model. So, uh, broadly you could easily identify there are two uh, you know uh, parallel things one is related to you subjective style and another is from society side. When we say from our side so first is the actualization and actualization lead to organismic valuing. We give more value to certain things as compared to others and it leads to positive regard. This positive regard lead to positive self regard and that is our real self. On the other hand a society, from society side you have certain conditions of worth. If you fulfill those worths then conditional positive regard you will be having which is interacting with positive regard also. And if it is say then conditional positive self regard which is connected with positive self regard and it connects with ideal self. So, from personal side we have real self and from societal message side we have ideal self. Sometime or for normal behavior we have match between real self and ideal self or can say congruence in real and in you know ideal self. On the other hand in some cases we have incongruence and these two are mismatched real self versus ideal self. Let us take a simple example here. For example, a student has capacity to achieve or to gain 60 percent marks, but societal message is one should get 80 percent marks. So, this discrepancy and that is why he has ideal self of 80 percent. So, his real self level is 60 percent uh, on the other hand ideal self says 80 percent. So, this discrepancy is called cause of incongruence and that is why we have neurosis. Here neurosis and psychosis are little bit different from abnormal psychology. So, let us understand how he has defined this neurosis and psychosis in his theory. He is saying that this incongruence between real self and ideal self is cause of neurosis and that is why we have threatening situation. So, if we have this threatening situation then we have anxiety, we may have stress, we may have uh, tension and because of this we are in trouble. For reducing this trouble we may use some defenses. If you know psychology then you can easily connect it with psychoanalysis where Freud discussed about defense mechanisms. He said id ego super ego these are three components and it has its own demands super ego has its own demands which are related to morality and it is related to pleasure principle ego role is to balance which is based on reality principle and its role is to balance between it super ego environmental forces and then balance all those things. In some situations it is able to, but in not in all situations. If it is not able to then we have anxiety, we have tension, stress etcetera and it hurts ego. So, for avoiding this situation we start to use defenses. Defenses broadly means we distort the situation. So, similar concept has been borrowed by Carl Rogers to describe his theory and he said we use certain defenses, but due to these defenses we go away from reality and it increased our uh, incongruence and shattered self and that is why we have psychosis. So, just to understand a little bit more about it, basic human needs are need for self actualization. Okay? So, then uh, if we have need for self actualization its response is unconditional positive regard and if we have this unconditional positive regard then we have self actualization. So, that is positive direction. On the other hand another basic need is need for 
positive regard which is from society side and here we have conditional positive regard. So, this conditional positive regard lead to in terms of result self discrepancy between real self and ideal self and that is cause of abnormal behavior in some settings. So, this incongruence occurs when there is a mismatch between any of these three entities here real true self plus self image has been included. So, what these three selves are? The ideal self, the person you would like to be, self image, the person you think you are and the true self, the person you actually are. If these three selves are highly connected with each other and you have congruency among these three, then you have not any problem in your life that not happen in all the cases. Sometime if you could see here, these are actually little bit connected with each other and sharing low level of variance, rather individuality also they have and that is cause of incongruence. So, self esteem suffers when there is a large difference between one's ideal self and self image and we have low self esteem in those situations. Anxiety and defensiveness are common when the self image does not match the true self. So, that is cause of anxiety and defensiveness we have. So, which defense mechanisms we use in that situation? Carl Rogers has used two defense mechanisms which broadly he has borrowed from Freud. He said one situation is denial you block out the threatening situation altogether, you just deny the situation. Denial for Rogers is what uh, Freud called repression. If you are keeping a memory or an impulse out of your awareness, refuse to perceive it. So, that is denial, you may be able to avoid uh, again, but for now you have just uh, away from this threatening situation. Another defense mechanism is perceptual distortion. It is a matter of reinterpreting the situation so that it appears less threatening. It is very similar to Freud's rationalization. For example, a student that is threatened by tests and grades may blame the professor for poor teaching, tricky questions, bad attitude, etc. So, just distorted the situation so that it could keep away from anxiety, stress, tension, etc. After giving his uh, theory explanation, he also discussed about the fully functioning person. He said there are five factors of a fully functioning person who has not any discrepancy between real self and ideal self. These characteristics are openness to experience, existential living here and now, organismic trusting, experiential freedom and creativity. Actually, we have another chapter outrightly based on character strengths. So, I will compile all these positive personality traits in that chapter and we will discuss in detail what does it mean. So, as per this theory, life is a direction not destination. The Carl Rogers also stated that life is a direction not destination. In research methods, he used Q sort technique. He had about 100 self referent cards, for example, I am a good person and then he had 9 piles. In 9 piles, list like me, like 1 and then various other piles and at the end most like me that is ninth one and one has to sort cards as per his or her responses. So, in this case you could easily identify someone's real self. In some cases, we may assess discrepancy between real self and ideal self by manipulating instructions. For example, if I say respond these as per these 10 cards and on in 9 piles when you count yourself real self. On the other hand, in another setting when you consider your an ideal self, then you respond for all these questions. So, if there is difference between when you are instructed to have real self and when you are instructed to have ideal self, the if there is discrepancy between two, then that discrepancy is uh, between your real self and ideal self. So, that is the way to understand human behavior as per this perspective. I think we should know 
therapy also along with his theory. His theory is known as non-directive therapy or client centered therapy or Rosarian therapy. There are various reasons to give these names and sometimes they were criticized also. For example, it was called a client centered therapy, but later on scholars realized that there are various other therapies on which we focus only on a particular client. So, client there are various other therapies could be client centered therapies. Another name was non-directive therapy. Non-directive because in this case actually the situation is we ask or therapist ask to provide unconditional environment and notion here is one could easily understand his problem as well as its solution when we provide unconditional environment to this person. So, here client is first talking about his problem and then he is talking about his solutions and here philosophical message is he knows better than a counselor what is solution of his problem. So, counselor or therapist role is to provide unconditional environment to this person. Uh, on the other hand, it has been realized that uh, even he is a uh, he is an active uh, listener, even in this situation he is reflecting here. So, reflection is the mirroring of emotional communication. Somehow, when you are showing even facial expressions or giving just direction. So, in this case you are actually active listener or giving shape to his behavioral changes. By doing this, the therapist is communicating to the client that he is indeed listening and cares enough to understand. So, that is why uh, this name was not used much non-directive therapy and later on it was shifted on a Rosarian therapy named as Carl Rogers therapy. Carl Rogers mentioned that we should focus on certain qualities, certain characteristics or positive traits of a counselor like these are congruence, genuineness, honesty with the client must be in a counselor or a therapist. Empathy was another quality the ability to feel what the client feels and quality was respect, acceptance, unconditional positive regard towards the client. So, he said person or therapist must have these three qualities before providing Rosarian therapy or client centered therapy to the clients. He focused on growth and fulfillment of individuals. So, that is the, his therapy to treat abnormal behavior in which broadly we are saying that provide unconditional environment instead of conditional environment during therapeutic setting. Let us know Maslow's theory also, especially which could contribute to the positive psychology. He proposed theory of human motivation. The basic of Maslow's theory is that human beings are motivated by unsatisfied needs and that certain lower needs, deficiency needs also he called them need to be satisfied before higher needs called growth or being needs can be satisfied. And he proposed hierarchy of needs and these needs can be counted in terms of deficiency need as well as growth or being needs. So, in this hierarchy first level needs are physiological needs. In physiological need basic needs are required hunger, thrust, sex, etc., sleep, reproduction, shelter, etc. Then he said if we fulfill at least at certain level, then we have next level need and this next level need is safety need. So, this safety need means personal security, employment, resources, health or required level of property, etc. So, we should feel safe. If we have fulfilled physiological as well as safety needs, then we think about love and belongingness. So, then uh, you know friendship, intimacy, family, sense of connections we would like to have in our personality. And these three needs are broadly counted as basic needs or deficiency needs. So, once especially at certain level these needs are fulfilled, then we think about esteem, self esteem. So, our self respect, self esteem, status, recognition, strength, freedom, etc. After that we have self actualization. So, for self actualization 
to some extent we can say there are certain conditions. Our basic needs should be fulfilled, we should not have deficiency needs and we should have self-esteem and then only we have self-actualization. So if we have that level, then these people have certain characteristics, very selected characteristics they have, but condition for all these main characteristics or positive personality traits are one should have self-actualization level. So selected characteristics of self-actualizing people he has proposed. These characters are efficient perception of reality, acceptance of self and others, spontaneity, simplicity, naturalness, focus of problem centering, detachment, the need of privacy, autonomy, independent of culture and environment peak experiences, deep interpersonal relations, democratic values and attitude, discrimination, means and ends, good and evil, philosophical unhostile sense of humor. He also focused on creativity, imperfection, resolution of dichotomies. So these were 15 characteristics which were identified in self-actualizing people by Abraham Maslow. These characteristics will be revisited in character strengths chapter once again. So, let us discuss in detail in future. So, humanistic psychology, if we evaluate this perspective, some positive side as well as some negative side this perspective have or to some extent we can say what is borrowed by a positive psychologist and what is limitations of this school. When we talk about positive side, optimist view of humankind which is in positive psychology also. Human abilities they have focused, again positive personality traits, character strengths and virtues have been focused in positive psychology. Growth potential, we are also focused on, we are programmed to grow. In positive psychology, we are talking about healthy personality and pyramid of needs is required to understand human behavior. Negative side of this perspective are non-scientific. Most of the time they proposed their ideas on the basis of their experiences. Some scholars identify that it is more philosophical approach rather psychological approach. Need evidence to support beliefs is required because we do not have much data collections and then studies and uh, objective results of these uh, findings. Self actualizers rare because preconditions are there and we do not have much practical applications of this area rather just understanding of human behavior. I think it is clear to us there are various branches or roots in of positive psychology in history of psychology whether it is about prevention and wellness programs, whether it is about post enlightenment or moral philosophy, ancient Greek or Aristotle's studies in which we are talking about eudonomia. Alport also focused on positive aspects of human personality which will be discussed in character strength chapters again. Humanistic psychology, I think that is very clear here, Carl Rogers and Maslow's work contributing to positive psychology a lot. If we just recap this class, you should know what is psychology, uh, its different branches as well as its different perspectives. Humanistic perspective and other psychologists contribution as historical background of positive psychology. Thank you very much.